So welcome Vivek, welcome to the Scrum Agile workshop and uh, you know more details and more information about Vivek as well as the uh, program agenda and everything Vivek will share with all of you. So welcome Vivek, welcome once again, over to you Vivek, thank you. Absolutely, thank you so much Akhil uh, for that lovely introduction. I never knew that I sounded so good when somebody is introducing me, right? So it's always a pleasure to get introduced like that. But thank you so much. It's absolutely a pleasure to be here in this workshop uh, amongst all the fellow students who have been actually working hard to get to the next level. And uh, when I was, you know, when we were talking in terms of, you know, how this should get through, I was, uh, when I came to know about the proposition, I was very, very excited. And uh, yeah, it's absolutely lovely, right? So thank you so much everyone for taking time out and being here on uh, a Thursday evening, not an easy day. I know some of you have exams, you know, the long weekends people may have planned, but I think the very fact that you have chosen to be here on this very day in the next three hours uh, actually shows a lot of your commitment in terms of learning, picking up new things and applying. So I'm very, very happy with that, right? So thank you so much. Uh, Okay, so I will. Uh, is my sound clear, audible? Yes, sir. Yes, no. Clear. Okay, okay cool. I love that because unfortunately I can only see Akhil on the camera, and everyone else is off camera. So <laughs> I'm just wondering, but then yeah, I would love to have people on the camera as well. That will really, really help me and you know boost my confidence. So yes. if at all, if at all you are in a state where you can turn on a camera, and uh, so yeah, I would really appreciate. It. Okay. And uh, is my screen visible with says Scrum Workshop? Yes, it's visible now. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Guys, I request all of you to please turn on the camera. So this is this is an interactive discussion. You know, this is not a lecture. So obviously, you know, you guys <laughs> definitely enjoy the next two hours. Please turn on the camera. Yeah, absolutely, and I'm I'm sure as we go along. Uh, you'll realize that it's not and then thank you for Akhil for putting that across it's you know I, I would have actually put that in the disclaimer as well but then this is entirely not a, a lecture while it, it reads as workshop typically but then the idea is more here to sharing the, it, the sharing the experiences and the nuances about the scrum as a subject and then of course also taking cues from all of you who have been actually putting some effort in order to get there right so Okay, so moving forward, uh, I said thank you so much for being here. Uh, some very, very important instructions as we move along and start to uncover the topics that we have for today, tomorrow, and day after. Right, so one is that uh, make sure that you have a pen and paper handy uh, uh, because as we go along the subject, if there's any question, any doubt, any clarification that you would need, on any of the topics, right? Sometimes we forget. So uh, have a pen and paper handy, make a note of it, and then you may want to, uh, and we have certain sessions between today, tomorrow, and day after where you can reach out to us and ask those questions. We'll be more than happy to give the best possible reply that we know of, and uh, in that way, at least we'll have more clarity about the subject. Number one. Number two, uh, if possible, please put a more, like, please place your mobile phones on the silent mode. Uh, it will help us to have a disturbance free meeting. Uh, I'm sure you would not want as we're speaking on a subject and somebody mobile rings in, it just disturbs the momentum. So please keep them on the silent mode. It really, really helps. Uh, if there are any questions uh, in between as we're speaking, uh, and if you need an immediate answer to it, or you think that, oh, this is something that I really would want to know an answer right now, use the chat box, uh, put your questions there. Uh, and I'll try my little best to see if we can answer within that or we'll probably take it to Q&A, but then do make an active use of the chat box. And uh, more importantly, every question, any doubt that you may have, try and make sure that your questions are relevant to the subject that we're speaking. In case you're not sure, we have a longer Q&A session that uh, we'll have at the end of, you know, very, very specific topics. You can come back, ask, and then of course we can see as how it actually transpires. But yeah, so those were the instructions to begin with, and uh, with that uh, we can get started because every single member who is here on this call is new to me. I don't know, uh, so uh, I think before we actually get on and get very serious with the topic, it was important, I believe, to do a kind of a little meet and greet. Uh, and I would not want to repeat myself, but then. Uh, Akhil has really 
done a wonderful job of you know introducing me but then very quickly uh, for the fellow members who joined a little late the, my name is vivek uh, and i have close to 19 years of professional work experience when i say professional it's including the corporate experience and of course my uh, you know like entrepreneurial journey where we have uh, so i'm co-founder and principal consultant at pi consulting uh, Pi Consulting is a firm where we do a lot of consulting training to organizations who are looking at uh, implementing uh, smarter ways of working so that they can have more efficient output. So that's typically that we do. A quick run through on some of uh, the locos. Now, like these are some of the companies that we had done projects for, right? It's not that I worked for them, but then there are some very big names here, right? From the Vodafone to Unilever, the Coke, the Target, Staples. Uh, and, and we have done a lot of different engagements, different assignments in different capacities and understood the process with these firms, right? So uh, with that, uh, the disclaimer here is that everything that I'm going to speak between today, tomorrow and day after, right? On any of the topics is uh, completely my experience that I've gathered in the last 19 years of my professional working experience. So, uh, and and it's it's not about being right and wrong. I'm definitely not here to claim that what I'm speaking is hundred is, is right or wrong. But uh, if there is a difference of opinion, some of you may have, which is absolutely okay. Uh, but the idea is that whatever I've learned, I'll actually share this with you. And if you feel otherwise, we can always you know have a conversation on a coffee or within the room itself. But uh, it's it's always what I have understood the best is what I'm actually sharing, right? So this is what the disclaimer is. And very importantly, as I mentioned, that this is not going to be a one way session. I hate, you know, at least when I say I hate, I uh, it's, it sometimes, you know, uh, get on me when I'm just speaking and speaking and speaking. I'm not really getting the insights because the sessions are for you. This session is for everyone who is participating. So it, it is very important that you all of you interact, all of you share your opinion. Uh, whatever you have, if you're not comfortable speaking, put them in the chat box, but then there has to be a constant interaction so that we can mold our learnings in a way so that you, you know, as you walk away from this workshop after, you know, three hours, so nine hours in totality, right? Three, uh, three hours every day, you are taking some very, very key actionables which you can implement in your projects that you're going to do or in fact of that phase one of the learning that you have had, right? So uh, with that, uh, so a quick overview of the agenda that we have for three days. Uh, so on day one, which is today, we are going to probably get introduced to Agile and some element of Scrum, uh, and then we'll come over to the, the other elements as well. Day two is uh, where we will actually go deeper into Scrum as a subject, you know, in terms of how do we implement Scrum, how do we uh, put them into the projects? Or you may have questions around, hey, how do we use Scrum in the what we are doing right now, right? So we may have those questions, think over it. And day three is typically when we actually put everything together into a kind of a simulation exercise, right? So we'll have smaller projects on day three. We'll actually divide you into certain groups. So it is very important that you attend all the three days, day one, day two, day three. And for any reason, if your friends, people that you know who are not attending today, please share the recording. Okay, the recording will be made available to the students, right? Yes, yes, we will provide perfect. Recording. Yeah, great. So they watch the recording, make the notes because that simulation will actually give you some real insights into what maybe at a very small scale, but it will give you real insight in terms of how to transpire the work that you've been doing into the scrum, right? Okay, enough of talking. I think I, you know, tend to speak a lot. Uh, as we move forward, right, uh, one thing that I've learned in my experience on uh, training and coaching people has always been to set the right expectations, right? So, which means that, uh, and as I said in my introduction as well, that I would want to make sure that as we finish the three day engagement over the three hours, uh, I've managed, I've been able to manage expectations of a lot of you. Uh, right. So while we are, you know, trying to get settled in, I think it is important that we come back. Uh, we, we start to make a note of what is our expectations from this workshop, right? Or what is that you have in your mind? I'm sure you would have attended this, you have planned to attend this, you have joined in with certain 
things in our mind. Okay, this is what I would want to, to you know, move out as key takeaway. This is what I would want to learn or their questions. So what I'm going to do is that I'm uh, stopping the screen sharing. I think I'll just pause it for a while and I'm sharing a link in the chat box. And what I want all of you to do is to go to that link and start putting your uh, where is the chat box okay and start putting your expectations if you can put your name great i think that will be absolutely lovely but uh, just go to this link now this is a myro link this is a collaboration board so uh, just click on this link go there and you'll see a lot of white so a lot of stickies there right and uh, go there make a note of what you think is would be a takeaway right uh, I'll probably give three minutes on this for everyone to think over and we think over that. What is that takeaway that you would want? And what we're going to do is that we're going to map as we finish the session along. I'll keep taking off the expectation. And the reason I'm asking for you to also probably name yourself on the expectation is that it will it will help us to validate that. Hey, have you understood this thing? Is there anything else that we can do? Probably. So that's very important. So uh, we're going to come back and revisit this as we go along. So yeah, feel free to add and I'm going to start my timer now. Uh, that's three minutes on the clock. So take your time and uh, I'm going to be very, very. Slow with the process in the sense that take your time, think over it. Start putting your expectations here and then we'll come back in next two, two minutes, 45 seconds. We'll have a look at it and then we'll move forward. And I can see that there are clicks all around. And by the way, I'm sorry, I'm you know constantly looking at my screen, which is on my right. So it's not that I'm purposely not looking at all of you. So yeah, don't mind. So that's that's something that's going wrong on my side. Not sure if I play music that will follow. Okay, the music part is gone. Uh, yes, offering the expectation from this session, uh, not the cohort, but then just the sessions between one, day one, two, and three is what we're looking at. Some very interesting questions shipping up. Just over a minute to go. Uh, you know, really, really encourage of you know all of you to think. There is no right and wrong to any question, right? Uh, so whatever is in your mind, just go ahead and put it there. I think uh, it will only help you as a participant to get more clarity. And uh, it's okay not to have any question. You may want to probably start this session with a very blank slate, but that's okay. But you know, in case you have Absolutely wonderful. Thirty more seconds. And we are closing in the last 10 seconds for this uh, expectation setting uh, exercise on this workshop. And the time's up, right? Uh, okay, it will not stop you from writing. You can continue to write, but uh, you know, uh, I have certain questions. We'll come back and have a look at it and as we go along. But uh, I also quickly wanted some support from all of you. Uh, now, in a chat box on a scale of one to five, with one being an absolute novice or having 
kind of no understanding about agile and scrum and five being a profession pro about agile and scrum on that scale where would you rate yourself right uh, put that number in the chat box between one and five uh, so that again it helps me to you know create an understanding of what is the audience that i'm catering to so in the chat box between uh, pick up a number between one and five with one being an absolute promise kind of no understanding and five being super proficient okay so i can see a lot of twos ones wonderful thank you so much uh just in case if you haven't uh put up a two or a one which is okay uh please go ahead and you know place a number between one and five if you haven't done that but uh what i hear and what i see here on the chat box is that a lot of us are uh, really new to scrum and agile uh, which means that uh, in terms of the content i will be a little slow in terms of making sure that each one of us have a fair understanding as we move along right now what we're going to actually learn in the next like nine hours of a journey together is not only going to help you in your immediate projects and assignments but also when you move away from your college life into working professionals right it will definitely make an impact in terms of how you're working on the projects right cool so with that uh, given that we have done expectation management and i'm you know i'm very keen to see us some of the questions so how it can help me in my project we'll definitely talk about this uh, i want to get clarity on complete complexity of my startup idea and how do i do prototyping wonderful i think we have a section there we'll talk about it to get an understanding about scrum and agile uh, know what facts about projects keeping assumptions aside okay so then topics here i have some idea about scrum and agile okay uh what is scrum and agile and knowledge about the process we'll definitely talk about that how to schedule my project that's interesting we'll definitely have some conversation there as well okay i think we have a big mix of questions coming in terms of right from getting an understanding of a agile scrum and also getting to know as how it can help in my project or also about complexity of you know the understanding of how it can help in the startup ideas we'll definitely talk about that very very interesting cool so going back to the powerpoint presentations uh, we'll start with the uh, introduction to agile right uh, okay how many people do we have on the call right now No, it's around 43. 40, 43. Okay. So what we're going to do is that we're going to I'm going to create breakout rooms and I'm going to probably send you all in smaller breakout rooms. And I'm going to give three minutes. Uh the breakout rooms could be between around four to five members, not more than that. And uh the next slide, and uh, so within the breakout room, you'll have to probably pick up one individual who is going to speak on the behalf of the breakout room, right? And then uh, once the time gets over, and of course uh, the exercise is that uh, you'll have to take a look at the screen that I'm sharing next after this, and think over what is one thing common between those images. So there are a set of so the three images that I'm going to show. Right, uh, think over it and come back and share what is that you have observed and what is common to those three images that you're gonna see on the screen, right? So I'm creating those breakout rooms. Uh, just one second. Okay, sorry. Uh, Akhil, do you want to probably create something because I am not, I'm just, you know. So okay, uh, I will make you host, then you can, you know, easily do that. You'll get all the okay. privileges. Okay, just give me one second. Reset, okay, I can see that settings just one second so we have i'll probably go with eight breakout rooms and uh, again i'm reiterating 
one individual as somebody who can speak on your behalf in terms of what is it you're looking at. And uh, the time that is allocated is three minutes on each of the breakout rooms. And as we finish three minutes, uh, you will be brought back to the main room. And of course, then we'll pick up room one to room eight, right? So I'm going to present a picture on the next slide. And this is going to be there for a minute, right? So the first picture that you see on the top is uh, a rafting. So there are people who are doing rafting. Uh, I'll give you the context of the second picture. The second picture is is that of a batter who is uh, doing a run chase in a T20 international match or a T20 match typically, right? Uh, I know that's a picture of Virat Kohli, but then consider that individual to be a batter who is doing a run chase in uh, a T20 or a T20 match. Uh, and third is uh, a Google map which helps me to navigate when I go from office to my home or go from one place to another, right? So these are three images. There are people who are doing rafting. There are people, so there is a batter who is doing a run chase in T20 and there is a Google map, right? Uh, you will have to find me some kind of a pattern or what is common across all these three that you see on the screen, right? And I'm starting the breakout sessions now, okay? Blue color. All of them would have been okay. There are people not assigned. Okay. Uh, are we supposed to speak down? No, I think I'm just trying to uh, send people in the different breakout rooms. Give me one second. Oh, that's only three breakout rooms. Sorry, my bad. I'll uh, send more people. Just one second. Um, sorry, I think I messed up on the number of rooms, but that's okay. Yeah, for some reason, I tried eight. Uh, Akhil, do you see people all all of them will be moved to the breakout rooms all of them yeah i think all of them joining uh so right now there are three breakout rooms in one around uh 8 13 11 yeah. they're joining yeah uh, okay okay fair uh, and i'll get sahan into maybe breakout room one Around 34 people joined in the breakout room now. Only a few people oh. have remained. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, we can give an automatic end, uh, so I'm getting that pop up message or else, you know, I mean, we can close the breakout room manually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think maybe 30 more seconds and then we'll close the breakout rooms. I'll okay. close. Yeah. Uh, okay. the breakout rooms. Okay, I'm just going to end the breakout room now. Uh, do we have people coming back on the? 
Yes, all of them. Or, are uh, all of them are should be back. Okay. First of all, true apologies. There should have been round eight, I think, but then there was some confusion. There were only three breakout rooms. So if you saw a number of people in a room, you know, true apologies. It should have been only four and five. But having said that, between room one and one, two, and three, uh, how about we get started with room number two, right? So who's going to speak on behalf of room number two? Hello? Anybody? Or did we don't have a discussion in room two? Hello, sir. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So while while we're deciding who's going to go in room number two, uh, between room one and three, who would want to go first? I want to go first. And which is that room? Uh, uh, breakout room three. Breakout room three. Yeah, please. Yeah. So, sir, we thought collectively, like, uh, we both of the three uh, images, like, show that we need to either re need to read somewhere or may we need to achieve something. And I will add, like, we want to achieve something in a very limited time. In both of the three cases, like I see this uh, in a very limited time, we want to read somewhere okay, or achieve somewhere. Very interesting perspective. I also did not think about that, but yeah, I think when I when when I when I recall that, I think that's a very interesting perspective. Now, uh, one thing that, and I'll come back to room, uh, you know, one and two again, but. Uh, so whatever we're going to talk about today, right, in terms of these topics, even before we actually unfold the subject, remember these are very, very foundational for learning the subject as a whole, right? Subject is completely, you know, we should, once we get into the technicalities, it should be straight in, straight out, right? But then I think it is important to understand that why is that we are actually getting there, right? So, okay, thank you so much. So what, I, what I'm hearing is that uh, we all are trying to reach at one, some place, in a very limited time is what I'm actually getting as one of the perspectives. Okay, good. Room one. Take this opportunity, speak for yourself, speak for the team. As I said, it's a very interactive session. And I assumed in all my life that interaction is a two way communication. So when I, you know, the, there is, because sometimes I wonder if there's no sound coming to microphone, right? So, room one, have we discussed anything? Is there a pattern? It's absolutely okay to come out and say we do not find any pattern. Sorry, we were just gossiping, which is also okay. I said sir? there's no right and wrong. Uh, hi, sir. Good evening. Hey, Nilan. Yeah. Yeah. So we saw uh, the blue color in common and we thought it might be showing trust in common. Oh, nice trust. blue color in common. <laughs> I, I should have picked up a different color of Virat Kohli, maybe have like a Bangalore challenges to make it more interesting. But that's a good observation to have a blue color in common, but very good. Anything else, Nilan, that you discussed in the room? No, uh, no, no, sir. Okay, room three. We have enough time. Sir, I already discussed room. Three. Oh, sorry, sorry, my bad. Yeah, my I I need more coffee, right? Sorry, my bad. Room one. Sir, room one, uh, room one, we did. Uh, yeah, room two. Uh, hello, sir. Gulabsha this side. Yeah, Gulabsha. Uh, so what I saw in these three images, uh both or uh, three of the images uh, shows that there is a process performing like uh, the rafting the batting and the driving okay and uh, they are performing some like activity to go somewhere and to achieve their targets brilliant very nice perspective process uh in doing a rafting process and actually doing chasing a run score and process and driving well, that's a very interesting perspective yeah. Anybody else is picking up anything that we're seeing from the image? I'm, I'm still, you know, waiting to hear that magical word on the images. Uh, they all are on their ground, like uh, um, being a uh, being a cricketer is on the ground, 
and uh, giving his best, uh, being a driver. Uh, he's doing his work on the road uh, and on drafting. Those people are uh, there for the enjoyment and they're enjoying. I love when I do these sessions because every time I get a very different perspective which I haven't thought of. Yeah, please. Who's going next? So may I speak? Yeah, please, please. I'm excited. People are speaking. I'm loving it. Yeah, please. Sir, I am from team number two and I think that in all of the three images, the common point is that all of them are moving towards their goals. Like in the first image, they are like in a challenge and they are like uh, drafting their boat to achieve some goal to reach some destination. In the in the second image, uh, the player is playing cricket and he he wants to win the trophy for India. And in the third picture, uh, the vehicle or something like that is moving ahead towards the final destination. So it's like in all of the three images, they are moving ahead towards their goal or towards their destination. Love it. So that's what I think. Uh, hello, sir. Wait. Yes. Uh, sir, actually, in my uh, personal view, in first image, uh, they are struggling uh, for the uh, toss their destiny, and uh, in second, uh, they uh, uh, they combine uh, their idea and uh, uh, place the track to uh, for the destiny, and then at mm. last, uh, in Virat Kohli uh, uh, image, they are uh, they toss the destiny and. Uh, they have uh, the goal. Uh, they have achieved uh, achieved the goal. So wonderful, and I'm getting some pointers on the chat as well while people are speaking. So, Piyush says finding yes, the to achieve something. Yeah, Dipansh, just one second. Uh, Dinesh has a point which I liked. A well coordinated team with a batsman at the front as a key player can navigate the hurdles in the start of the journey. And uh, yeah, Dipansh, yeah, please go ahead. I think yeah, share point. So my perspective is that all three measures show that they are facing obstacles in the path. In the first image, the river has uh, the uh, turbulent flow, which causes the boat to the raft to uh, unsettle. And in the second image, the batting, the fielders are the obstacle. The, uh, the batsmen need to clear the obstacle to hit a six or a four. And in the third image, the obstacle would be traffic jams or the cars. OK, brilliant. Okay. Uh, sir, I have also wanted to add a similar point at the time. Uh, uh -huh. All of them, all of them are having some sort of hurdles in their paths. Even the driver's path is not straight at all. So that's what I wanted to add as well. I am loving with the conversation heading and exactly. And I think we are very close to that point that I really wanted all of you to see. Uh, hello, sir. Can I make a point here? Yeah, please. Yeah, so I feel they're trying to get to the uh, the destination point in the fastest time possible. For example, uh, you try Google Maps, they usually show you the fastest uh, route to reach a destination. Similarly, mm -hmm. in terms of rafting, you go in the path of water, which flows the fastest so that you get more thrill and fun, plus you take less time. And even in terms of uh, the batsman, so he tries to reach the other side as fast as possible so that he doesn't get out by the bowler. Brilliant. So I feel the fastest. Good. Oh, fast test, the goal, being grounded, having an objective. I think these are all some great points, right? But there's, and I think I love that one word somebody said, hurdle. There are hurdles in our journey as we go along, right? But there's one element that I really wanted all of you to see beyond what you see in the image, right? Okay, so let's take a step back, right? How many of us have done rafting? as in-person drafting, put it in the chat box. Mm. Great, Akash has done drafting, wonderful. Great. Uh, how many of us has actually played cricket? Or, like I know people are a big fan and they would love. Dipansh is playing cricket, wonderful. Akash is playing cricket. And uh, never did but want to do rafting. Please come out to Rishikesh, it's a great place. We can do rafting, great. Uh, and how many of us are actually driving or have driven, right? Car, bike. Great. Okay. Now, uh, when you, okay, so I think because uh, many of us, uh, right, okay, sorry. So because many of us uh, have 
done a lot of they play a lot of so i'll probably start with the cricket enthusiast because that's a very common example you know i think people will be able to relate so when you're actually playing a uh, high intensity uh, in a high intensity situation such as a t20 match right and you're chasing uh, assume that you get you're getting started to chase uh, 140 on a wicket which is absolutely flat it's a belter so when you're starting, what is the probability of winning the match, assuming that Rohit Sharma and Virat Kohli are going to open the innings? Hundred percent? Yes. It's very likely, right? With that, we would want to make sure that we go on and make that winning start. And same, it's you know, same is when we start from home. If I have to travel to a destination, there is, I mean, okay, I would reach probably in a couple of hours, maybe in one hour. And same as the rafting. So when we start rafting, you know, we have a certain plan in place. We get started, right? That, okay, this is a point A, we're starting and we need to reach point B. Now, in that process or in that journey of going from point A to point B in rafting, even in driving, and also when we're playing cricket, there are there is a change in the circumstances, right? With rafting, you get waves. In cricket, you might lose three quick wickets for five runs. And, and while driving on your way to your office or home, wherever you are, you might actually hit traffic, which you did not anticipate. What is that you do then? Can you just repeat the last part? Okay, if you hit obstacles, okay, if you hit obstacles, what is that you do? Reroute, rebound. Reroute. So slow down for a bit, take suggestions. Okay, is any of the things, okay, so while we're getting those inputs, uh, a quick question, for any of the activities like rafting or scoring a certain number of runs in a certain number of overs or driving from point A to point B, are we 100% sure of the result? Okay, so one common thing that we have in all the three images is the element of uncertainty. There will always be an element of uncertainty while you are navigating, you know, doing rafting or, you know, playing a cricket match or even while driving. So when the uncertainty hits it in terms of any situation that you may not have accounted for, you kind of replan, right? In terms of your maybe the goals in terms of your approach, in terms of your process as well. So there is always kind of a replanning that goes into it, right? And that replanning could be of a very different nature as well. Now with that as a thought that every time there is an uncertainty that comes in, you've got to replan and rethink. I want to hold this thought with you for next couple of days because a lot of it that we're going to cover in the next couple of days in two different sessions is the, the basic underlying theme is always about uncertainty and the change that is going to happen, right? Just keep that in mind. I just wanted to bring that notice because that's the base and the foundation of a lot of our learning sessions, right? Okay, moving on. So why is that we are actually today talking about Agile Scrum, right? Uh, so I'm not sure how many of you, but then back, uh, in the days when I started my journey, I mean, as as a developer, I started my journey back in 2003, um, and and prior to that, I've uh, done few courses. So in 1990s or even before that, right? So there was a set process of doing any kind of software development, or there was set process to do certain kind of processes in certain industries, and there was a very clear pattern to it. Right. So, for example, in the cases that we saw that if you want to probably go from point A to point B, there is a very clear process that I would sit in the car and start the engine. 
I'll drive, I'll go from point A. So there is a very set process to what I'm actually trying to achieve. And that process, because they were sequential in nature back then in 1990s, they were called as a waterfall method. Now, a lot of example that we're going to talk about in today and tomorrow will be related to software as a base, but then that can also, you know, uh, we can relate to other industries as well. So what you're seeing right now on a screen is a waterfall method. And th that's typically a lot of organizations even today work in that method is that if there are certain things to be built, we first start with analysis, right? Uh, you would go do a market research, you would analyze certain things, you would convert that analysis into a design that can be then uh, further implemented. Now that design can be validated and of course then we get into the implementation mode the once the implementation is done, we would actually test the product or service that we're building. And once that testing is done, we would make it live and do maintenance. So what uh, so what we are actually seeing right now, okay, and there could be stages which could actually differ from here, right? So this is just an example. This is exactly how the journey has flown ever since, uh, I think 1970s when the, uh, like the software industry really started to pick up in West and Europe as well. So this is this was the prima facie of a lot of development that used to happen, right? Analysis, design, implementation, testing, maintenance. Uh, but I think 1990s, like a lot of people realized that there is a crisis that has hit, uh, a crisis that has hit the industry uh, of especially the software development. Right? And there was a crisis because by the time, if you go back and look at the image again, right? So this is where we had the analysis part being done. And this is where we have maintenance or the rollout is done, right? So between analysis and maintenance and going live, companies usually used to spend good three years for any production to go live. A good three years, given that it was a, a simple, maybe, uh, uh, that was standard life cycle of the projects actually getting delivered between anywhere in two to three years, right? Now, uh, what it meant for a lot of stakeholders who are giving projects was that in those three years, and I'm going to probably give a graph, and this is being actually quoted from, uh, you know, one of the well-established Wall Street Journal magazine. If you see that this is the time, right, that has been taken to deliver a project, and this axis is actually uh, the certainty of actually delivering the project, right? The, what is the on time, on budget, right? So as you see that as there was more time taken to deliver the projects, when I said deliver the projects, back in 1990s and like between 1970s, 1990s, a lot of projects were getting delivered after three years. So if I'm a project, if I'm giving a project to somebody, I would only see the project live after three years. That's a lot of time. I know we are actually in a time where it's the, the things are changing very rapidly, but even 25, 30 years back also, three years was a lot of time for people to build any kind of a software or service. And as you can see, as the, the time elapsed, we were actually having less and less projects which are actually on time on budget, which meant that by the time you're delivering a project to somebody, maybe the situation would have changed, the market dynamics would have changed, there would have been competitors who would come out with a new requirement, or maybe the requirement may still actually tie down, or maybe the buyer persona may completely change. It is possibility that that's what used to happen, right? So people uh, started to really wonder that is this, is this the way that we would want to evolve, right? So what happened in, I think, early 2000, 2001? So we had around 18 industry experts, right? When I say industry experts, there still are some of them. They came together uh, and they met in Utah, in the US. Uh, and these are the 18 experts that you see on the screen, right? Uh, Ken Black, Michael Breed, Martin Flower, John Ken, and all of them. So they were actually working in different organizations, different industries. They had, they were actually publishing papers, you know, speaking in different forums. They they came together and they brainstormed 
on how that we can make this entire process of software development a little light and make it so that we can have a faster turnaround time on the delivery that we're making. Right? They brainstormed for well over two days. So they actually spend a lot of time uh, doing, and th like these are the actual photographs of 2001. Uh, we actually brainstormed together, just trying to you know get the insights and experts from each other. What you know, everyone was talking about the best practices that they have been following, and they made again uh, like these are the actual notes of those sessions, which I could get hand off, and they actually built in what they used to call, what is even called today, is an agile manifesto. Okay, what is what is that you think of when you hear, when you hear the word agile? What what comes to your mind? Forget process and everything else. What does agile trigger in your mind? Extremely flexible. Flexible and fast. Fast. Anybody else has a different thought opinion? Changes direction very quickly. Changes direction very quickly. Brilliant. Right. So when these 18 gentlemen came together and they actually spent a lot of time, they said that, OK, uh, based on what we have experienced in our own journey as experts, uh, we would want to probably build something which will give direction to other people in terms of how to do software development, which can give, give us faster results. And I say faster, I'm not talking about better results. I'm talking about faster results so that we can have bit first hand feedback from the market and the stakeholders as early as possible in the system. Right? So they built something what they call as an agile manifesto. And they said, OK, we are actually coming with with a manifesto, something like uh, if you were to probably do a uh, ways of working, if you were to refine a ways of working, you may want to follow this manifesto. And that manifesto had four values and 12 principles. So if you go to the site agilemanifesto.org, it still has that manifesto there and you know people can read. It's still there in uh, signed by all of these you know uh, 18 gentlemen there, right? And it spoke about four values. It says individuals and interactions over process and tools. That's first value. Individuals and interactions over process and tools. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And fourth was responding to a change over following a plan. Recall the images that we saw. We were actually trying to respond to a change. A change that wave brought in, a change that uncertainty brought in, a change that a traffic brought in. We were responding to a change and we we're actually taking corrective actions and then moving towards a goal. Right? So these four values, right? They said, okay. So these are the four values that you may want to run this through. And they crafted it and said, OK, this is the thing. Okay. And then there were 12 principles. So these 12 principles spoke about uh, customer satisfaction being the number one, uh, the very first thing that the organizations need to be looking into. Uh, we should be looking into adapting to the changing requirements, right? Now, I'm not sure how many of you have experienced this, but uh, when I started my career back in 2003 as a developer. We used to go, we used to swear on requirements, right? Which means that if there are requirements that are cast in, and then we used to build the development on the certain requirements, and if those requirements changed, there was a, something called a change request that used to come in. So people not very happy with changing requirements. They wanted to build a product or service on requirements that have been crafted. But with changing times, it was said that okay, maybe one of the principles in Agile is that we first want to be fast, we would want to adapt to changing requirements. We would want to do more frequent deliveries, and we would want to communicate very regularly. Uh, again, having a supporting team member, involving in a more face-to-face -face communication, having a measurable work, you know, like there has to be a measure of uh, you know what is that we're actually doing. Uh, uh, measure of a work progress 
there has to be a development process, a good design to it. Uh, we should continue to seek results and reflect and adjust. Right. So the last one is very important: reflect and adjust regularly. And you will see as why these are important. But typically, what it meant was that between these four values and twelve principles, right? Uh, they said that okay, we have now crafted this agile manifesto. Please take it. And they started to then start, you know, speak at different forums. And they published a white paper and then started to speak at different forums and started to really become, you know, it was a refreshing idea that started to hit industry back then. People said, okay, maybe this is very interesting in terms of software development. That now we are looking at certain things that we have not not done before. It was welcome change by the industry. It started to become very, very popular. But there's one problem with this. We have values, we have principles, but there's one problem with this agile manifesto. Anybody would want to take a guess why? Or what the problem is? The one who answers the first gets a prize for me. Okay. Ramakan did something which I don't know what it was, but then <laughs> maybe he was talking, but okay. So one challenge or one very, very fundamental problem with that framework, sorry, that uh, Agile Manifesto was that it only talked about values and principles it did not speak about how it needs to be done. Right? So you have told me, okay, these are the values and these are the principles that you need to keep in mind, which was left to the people who are adapting and now getting into it that, okay, when I start to implement, when I start to work on my engagements and my assignments within the agility, right? I may want to keep these values and principles in mind, but I don't know what process to follow. So there was absolutely no process that they defined. They left it people to define their own process. And that was a big gap that people wanted to start filling in, right? So as we uncover Agile over a period of time, we'll see that the Agile is then was then followed by a lot of frameworks. And these frameworks actually gave a lot of set of defined rules, methods on how to actually implement the things on the ground. So we had Agile at the top, which kind of had values and principles, and that values and principles were inherited by these smaller frameworks. And these frameworks were then carried within the organizations to actually implement it. Right? Is that is that making sense? Clear? Values and principles, frameworks, and frameworks were actually getting executed. Any doubts, questions until here before we move forward? Because I really want to make sure that we have understood the difference between the agile, the frameworks, and the execution. Agile is only talking about how your framework should look like or what a framework. And agile, by the way, the manifesto in agile is not binding it does not say that you have to do like this it only recommends that okay these are things that you may want to keep in mind okay uh, sir can you repeat the what the last uh, term was and what it uh, meant? I, I i may i said that agile was has never been the manifesto never said that this is this is binding in the sense that you have it, it was never uh, implementation it was never like you have to do things this way it only recommended that if you want to probably do this you know if your system follows these values if your system follows these 12 principles you're good to go great and there is no governing body for agile as well the three things you said agile framework and what was the third Ex one? execution execution Okay, so frameworks and execution are very like correlated on the ground. We'll speak about it, but I really wanted to make sure that you have all of you on the call have a clear understanding, uh, you know, as how to differentiate 
agile as only an approach framework is how you execute those approach on the ground okay okay moving on now uh, okay i'm going to probably do something here on the screen and uh, just one second okay so while we are actually building that thought process of agile and before we get introduced to frameworks and how do we actually do that i wanted to uh, you know have I wanted to show you something, right? I wanted to probably draw something for you. On a screen, okay, you see there are two axes. And apologies for the drawing. Okay, can you see the drawing? That, that's been yeah, yeah. So good. yeah, okay, okay. So there are two axes, right? So axis here is talking about a point zero and point infinity and this is point infinity assuming that's a point infinity we're actually talking about that axis right and this is a space where so when, when we're building something when you're doing something so every time we get to start something right what is the like what are the first two things that we think of one is that do i know how to do it do i know how to do it and do I know how much time it is going to take me? Those are two primary things that we kind of think of, right? When so when I'm starting a project, I, my first key question is that, hey, do I have skills or do I know how to do it? Now, in some cases, I would know how to do it, right? So this scale is how, right? Which is how to do it. And this is what typically. Because if my what is very clear, the time would the time taken would be less if my what is not very clear. So for example, uh, uh, and, and the scale here is that as we move further along the axis, as, as I move from here to here. I'm actually moving in a direction that I don't know how to do it. And I'm moving on this scale that I don't know what I'm building. Has it happened to anybody that you don't know what you're doing and you don't know how you're doing it? Very interesting, right? Okay, think over it. So, for example, so as I'm closer to the scale, so if I know what I'm building, and if I know how it is to be built, right, this quadrant, it's very simple. I know what needs to be built, and I know how it needs to be built. What could be an example that one can think of? This is a zone of no uncertainty. I know how to do it, and I know what I'm building. So one of the examples could be your manufacturing units or the production units, right? If you walk into any of the production units, somebody who is building a car, right? They know exactly what they're building, and they know how to put the pieces together and produce a car. They're very clear, right? That's a great point. They're very clear, crisp. There'll be 30 cars that will be produced today, and this is the process. There's no uncertainty, there's no questions. They're very clear in the head, okay, clean. So this is a zone of no uncertainty, right? Which is absolutely zero. But as you move further, right, this zone starts to become big gap. 
and then we start to probably okay so i'll probably what i'll do is that i'll also touch i know infinities can't be matched but then just for the sake of this diagram right and on the other hand we have this zone complete opposite zone which means i don't know what i'm building and i don't know how it will be built extremely opposite that is a zone of chaos right and somewhere in between simple and chaos is your complex the entire zone between simple and chaos is complex there is a lot of uncertainty that lies so when we speak of frameworks right and this different quadrants actually you know there are different frameworks that would apply so not every organization not every company that you're working for not everything that you're working on may be chaotic okay what is okay so imagine so we spoke of an example of a simple here what could be an example of a chaos maybe two friends sitting in a bar trying to talk about a startup idea they don't know how to build and they don't know what they're building there's a there's a chaos right now don't go by the word but that's a proper chaotic thought process which means that there is a framework here as well in, in terms of how to handle that chaos there's a framework out here that handles how to do a simple process so remember we actually initially saw that uh, waterfall method where we had the requirements we had the implementation we had the go live so that process fits into a simple one because we know how to do the things we have a very clear understanding there's a very clear requirement it's not changing and there's a timeline we deliver so that so that part of the process waterfall fits into simple chaos is very different so you may have heard about things like design thinking right design thinking fits into chaos which is where we're trying to validate a lot of things that we actually come away right so that fits into the chaos and in between is all a complex where the agile starts to happen right which is i kind of know how it will be done i somewhat know what i'm building uncertainties right and as i start to go in that direction i'm trying to address uncertainty so i'm kind of in a complex environment that i may have some information but not 100% in terms of what and how so i'm trying to address that uncertainties and building in that space so agile as a philosophy fits into the engagements and the process that is a little uncertain right and has that uncertainty in it so if you talk that can agile uh, and, and of course like there are agile frameworks for simple as well we'll talk about lean and everything else maybe if we have time but a lot of it that you will do in scrum a lot of that you will do in some other the frameworks so very first question that you will have to ask yourself is that what i'm doing does it is it a chaotic is it a simple or is it a complex process 9 out of 10 times it will be a complex process everything that you do like in your day to day life right i mean i i, I recall my college days that at the start of the year that we were very upbeat about you know cracking the exam where there's a plan and as we move closer to the exams we were uncertain about how we want to go by right and then we actually handpicked the subjects that the chapters that we want to finish to get some numbers or at least the passing grades and everything else right so agile also applied there that one night before the exam what are the five chapters that you would want to do to clear the exam not everything so we are adapting to the situation kind of thing right so everything that happens around us is also very uncertain so if you actually start to look beyond the systems in your day to day life and i'll probably share that probably tomorrow or day after that how you can apply agile in your 
real life as well to make yourself more, more productive. Right? That's slightly out of context, but then you, 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 know, you would absolutely love that part as well. So all I'm trying to say is that once you understand this piece that what I'm doing, is it simple? Is it complex? Is it chaotic or is it like complex? Then I think it becomes a lot more clear to you that, okay, this is the process that I'm going to follow. Right? I'll take a pause here and see if there's any questions that anyone has on this because I just wanted to spend a little more time here building this foundation about simple, complex, and chaotic. Okay, sometimes, you know, uh, it's absolutely okay. You can type in your questions as well if you're not willing to see, but that's absolutely okay. But uh, uh, just to give a recap, on you know what we've just spoken that there is a simple grid so they've added two more layers which is complicated but then i always consider that beyond simple it is always complex and then it's chaotic very interestingly i i came across something that i have always kept very handy with me uh, and i always refer to this uh, that every time you start a project and i you know i can actually stick my neck out and speak on this that every time i stick out a project uh, it starts with the chaos, you see, where we are uncertainty around the what and uncertainty around the how. It's chaotic, and then we move from chaos into the complex world, into the complicated, and eventually it becomes simple. So while we actually saw the grid the other way around, that simple is where you, and that's purely from understanding. But see everything that's happening around you or even in the projects that you're working on, or you might be working on in your future, even at a corporate level, a lot of thought process starts at a chaotic level. And there are decisions that are taken and that decisions are then slowly started to probably get addressed in terms of what and how, and you know there's uncertainty about certain developments and then slowly steadily come to a point. So for example, I've, if I start to build uh maybe a chatbot application right maybe i'm just thinking way back when there was nothing like that it could be chaotic but then once the application is live into the production stage then it becomes very simple then it's only maintenance about certain you know until there are features getting like rolled out that's one that i can think of right so that's the, i think there was some question here on the chat as well i'm not sure so again, uh, just a quick check with everyone is, and probably you can, and I would really appreciate if you can actually give me in the chat that is the idea about the chaos, complex and simple clear. Do we now know where agile needs to be used? Good, I like. I think it's only Satvik who understood. Okay, fair, good. Thank you, Milan. Yeah, you know, your answers would, you know, encourage me because sometimes when I don't see those answers coming and I really feel, is this, is this, like making sense to the audience, right? And feel free to you know stop me and say that Vivek, we are not understanding anything. Uh, okay, thank you, Afrin. Right? Please repeat one of the uncertain and chaos. Uh, okay, say for example, Afrin, if I tell you that Afrin, you'll have to make a rocket launcher, which needs to be delivered in one year. Is that a chaotic situation? Because the first question is that, oh. because I don't know how to make and what am I building? Rocket launcher, I've heard, but I don't know what I'm building, right? So everything where you don't have any clue about how, like how and what, is a chaos. And you don't tell me that subjects that we're doing and we don't know what we are studying and how we are studying. That's that's not a chaotic situation, right? That's peace. That will be very. So that has to be very simple. But yeah, anything like from an implementation and delivery standpoint, anything that is in a very initial ideation stage, if I was to probably use that word, 
anything which is an ideation stage and is still to probably get an MVP is a chaotic stage. From an idea to a build directly goes through from the chaos to simple. Does it help, Afri, to uh, get yes, a Good. Okay. I'm also mindful of the time. Okay, it's 8 15, 7 6. Okay. Cool. So, having said that, there's one more element that I really wanted to talk about before we really start to uncover the Scrum and the modalities in the Scrum, and that's around empirical. Right? Now, uh, the world of empirical, now there are two actually uh, distinct worlds uh, in the uh, development side, right? One is a very defined world, which we saw, right? Which is where we know what we're building. There are steps that are crafted and it's very simple, like we saw. That's what we say is a defined world. And the waterfall method is slightly tilted towards the defined world. A lot of that, so something that you do every single day, day in after day out, if I was to probably take a real life example, is a very defined method of working, right? But as you move towards unknowns and there are some innovations involved and there is a complex environment, you start to get into that empirical world. That's empirical process. So, and you would hear this very often, you know, in your, like as you move along in terms of the defined versus empirical empirical is something that a lot of uh, people go by right and actually talk about right so uh, i just wanted to probably bring that clarity that defined and empirical right uh we spoke about uh, the problem part right i think we have already done that in terms of uh, the problem that agile world had was that it did not define how to go about this? What would I do of values and principles if I don't know how to apply this? Right? Which is where the organizations all across the globe, the people who had some experience, they all you know, came together and they started to build what they're calling as a frameworks. Right? So frameworks typically are nothing but their set of rules and that define that if you were to apply Agile in your working process, what it would look like. Are, are rules to start the project? Or, or how is my team going to get structured? How is that my work going to get structured? What are the different roles that I have? Agile never speaks about that. So if you go to agilemanifesto.org, you will see that Agile really does not talk about it. Say on your own, please. And people then started to pick that up and say, okay, because you did not define anything for us, we will build frameworks around it. Right. And then different organizations, different people, different experts based on their working experience and their knowledge, what they started to do was to build what they're calling as different frameworks. So there's a very popular term called Agile Umbrella. Right. And what Agile Umbrella does is that if you see that there are so many different frameworks that you see in that umbrella. So we have a framework of Scrum, we have framework of a Lean Kanban, uh, and there are some engineering practices like XP, CI, CD, which are again a uh, very popular DevOps word these days, uh, testing around feature driven, trust driven, these are all. So everything, and they all, all of them have a, a very defined structure a structured approach to do the things, but then they inherit the, the philosophy of agile within them, right? And then, of course, there are other frameworks like a scrum of scrums, less, dad, safe, there are so many of them, right? Now, because there are so many of them, every framework has a different set of rules, every framework has a slightly different way of operating upon it, but within all these agile umbrella, right, all these frameworks, Scrum is by far the most popular agile methodology. Or is the most popular framework that we can say. So we have, so there is a survey that goes all, you know, every year, uh, which, you know, is rolled out to uh, different organizations all across the globe. And uh, every year people rate 
in terms of what are the frameworks that they would want to or they have adopted. So even today, Scrum rules 58% of the agile projects all across the globe have Scrum as a framework. And then, of course, there are other projects like a hybrid model. There is a Scrum band, there's a Kanban, and there are smaller percentages as well, depending on the use case. But Scrum rules the framework world as of today as well. Okay. Cool. Now, now is the time when we start to, now that we know, okay, even before that, are we now clear the, the difference between the term Agile and Scrum, how these two are different? Yes. So one of the, like, I would say one of the challenges that we have is that people always say Agile is Scrum. Agile is not Scrum. Agile is uh, just uh, guidelines. Scrum is a framework. So Scrum sets within Agile. So typically, so don't always assume that Agile is equal to Scrum or Scrum is equal to Agile. They're not interchangeable. Scrum is a framework. Agile is only a guideline, right? It's not even that. Okay, moving on. Now, now that we are trying to decode the Scrum and the methods around that, we'll go back and talk about the history and evolution of how Scrum started. Unlike Agile, and you would say, why is that we're doing it? Now that we know Agile, is it important for us to know the history of Scrum as well? Yes, sometimes it is important to know the foundations. And trust me, once we go like get over with these foundations today, I think you'll really enjoy the implementation of Scrum between second half of today and then tomorrow as well. You will really, really enjoy it, right? So uh, back in 1986, right? So the two Japanese gentlemen, uh, Hirotaka Takichi, right? And uh, so they 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 actually like had a white paper in Harvard Business, uh, which spoke about the new new product development game. And they spoke about how they felt that there could be a slightly different approach to the software development. You remember when we spoke of Agile Manifesto, we said that there are experts, different experts, you know, coming all across the globe who have their own opinion and view on how things should be done. Uh, so in 1986, this article was published in HBR, and uh, one of the gentlemen. Uh, Jeff Sutherland, who is the founder of Scrum. So Scrum was founded by two gentlemen, uh, Jeff Sutherland. I know, so that, that's just, uh, this. So this is uh, like um, taken from an article, right? And hence it may not be clear, but then uh, I've actually tried to include that. So the left side, okay, so my left, okay. So this is uh, some reference of that HBR uh, article. I'll share the link, you can go through that. But typically the idea was that they wanted to give a sense of how it is, you know, how this new whole new defined approach can really help the software development teams, right? So with this article, there were two gentlemen, uh, Jeff Sutherland and Ken Schwarzberg. Now these are the founders of Scrum and they were very, very impressed with what they saw or what they heard on this article, right? They, they really said, okay, this is something that we can really adapt in our ways of working and how we're actually building up. And in 1993, they started to put together what they're calling as Scrum today. This is on that 1986 article, right? So they, they built something and the one that's issue on the right. Uh, so he's Jeff Sutherland and he's Ken Schwarzberg. They are the fathers of Scrum and uh, and and like very, very renowned individuals on their own circle, right? So, uh, and in 1996, right? And so remember, this is even before the Agile Manifesto came in place. Agile Manifesto came in 2001. Scrum was being actually built even before that, right? So 1993, they actually built Scrum in the very first version. In 1996, they actually first presented Scrum at 
Uppsala conference. And that's where it started to really become popular. And, you know, and as it started to become popular, in 2001 in that agile manifesto if you actually look at agile manifesto and then you look at the contributors you will find jeff sutherland and ken schwarzberg as well so they were very instrumental in actually driving this so that entire journey uh, that started in 1993 uh, started to take shape in 2001 and that's where scrum started to become very popular with a lot of it organizations now because they had now they had a clarity of what agile is and with scrum guidelines they knew what to do what teams to form what roles to hire for how to actually get the things done right and that's where it all started that's where it's all started to build up on the screen typically right now the question that i always pondered upon is what is a scrum by the way, what's so, so this? I'm you know, I'm not sure if how many of you uh, see the rugby, uh, but uh, you know rugby is a very popular sport, which is uh, you know played in Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa as well. This is this position is called scrub, right? and you must be wondering how is this even remotely connected with what we're doing. But there's a significance of this image, right? Uh, I would not go into go in detail, but then you know, as we are actually trying to, uh, so when the ball is positioned, every time the game starts in the scrum, when when the, when the scrum happens, the team work together and tries to push the opponent over the line, and and and, and you know the philosophy was taken from there in terms of the teams working together and so on and so forth. The word was handpicked, and it all started to build scrum. So scrum has a reference of a teamwork that was picked up from rugby and that's what we should be knowing particularly right okay everything about scrum as in terms of what it does what it should be how it should shape up is all lined up in scrum guide it's all lined up in scrum guide so uh the image that you see here is of november 2017 uh, but then, of course, we have the newer version of the Scrum as well. So we have a new Scrum Guide that was released in November, I think, 2020. This is the latest version of the Scrum Guide that we have. So this is the timeline in terms of uh, uh, the first Scrum Guide was launched in February 2010. And then over a period of time, there were certain revisions based on the feedback. Again, remember, this is a very adaptive process. Uh, Scrum guide that talks about the process, method, tools, modalities uh, is again they're taking feedback from the people who are implementing this on the ground, right? They take the feedback and they start adapting, making some changes in terms of how things are being built up, how things are being done, and so on and so forth. And then we see a newer version of Scrum guide. And by the way, uh, Scrum guide is only 18 pages. It's only 18 pages. So you can actually download the Scrum Guide from the net. It's absolutely free. Anybody can read it. And it talks about, and what it tells is that for anybody to implement Scrum, if they can read those 18 pages and build a team with those guidelines that are given the Scrum Guide, they would have started on the Scrum journey, right? The so Scrum is making sure that you have everything that is required from those uh you know tools methods process point of view and then then tackle those uncertain problems that you're actually looking at so the so scrum guide is what people okay again this guide talks about a lot of clearly defined rules methods but again they are not pres they're not prescriptive they're prescriptive prescriptive in nature sorry they're not prescriptive in nature they don't prescribe anything they say okay this is how it should happen now it is up to you as an organization or a firm or who's wanting to implement scrum how should you go about it for some organizations it is a plain vanilla implementation of scrum that works 
for some organizations, it really doesn't work. So the change, right? But we, what, what we're going to do, like between today, tomorrow, and day after, is only going to talk about the plain vanilla implementation of Scrum. But the, as you go along in the near future, when you start working with the organization, you will see a different version of Scrums as well coming into the play, right? So which means that they may have taken some inspiration from Scrum and built another framework. So I was part of uh, CAP and Accenture. I think uh, those are two organizations that I know that I was part of where they had their own framework of implementing Agile, which was influenced by, you know, which is inspired by Scrum. So there are different organizations who do that, but yeah, that's the sense. So Scrum Guide is something that, you know, people really, really want, want to look into and get started with. Okay. And this is the very first view of Scrum, right? So this is what Scrum framework is, which means that, uh, you know, we have certain roles. It talks about, and of course, we'll, you know, decode this a little later in the day as we progress and move along. But uh, in terms of uh, what are the different events, what are the different roles, uh, uh, how we should go about it, uh, so Scrum Guide talks about all these things, the roles, the you know the process, the methods, the what are deliverables. That is exactly what we're going to build in next few probably sessions you know, tomorrow and day after, right? So I just wanted to give a brief overview of what Scrum is all about and how does it look like. Okay, now. Like everything else, you know, Scrum also has certain values that they live by, right? So Agile has a value, four values, 12 principles. Scrum also says that, okay, and you know, because it was an inspiration from Agile, they say that, okay, we also have five values that we live by. And it is always encouraged that every Scrum team member, right? So once you start to go in the teams and become a Scrum team, every Scrum team member, has these five values that they can think of. So we have a value in terms of a courage, which means that the Scrum team members should have courage to do what is best for the project. And we'll work on the difficult. And you know, once you start to do that, you know, you'll understand that why it is important is to make because in so like one of the core philosophies of Scrum has always been having a team uh, that is autonomous. And uh, what autonomous teams means, we'll talk more about it tomorrow as well, but a Scrum team has everything right from the start to the end on their own. So every team member in the Scrum team is, is expected to be somebody who can contribute to the team. So they would do the report requirements on their own they would do the development on their own they would rather test on their own they would actually deploy so everything that is related to building and deploying any application right if i'm talking on the software like development prospect will be done by the team itself right so the scrum members so scrum team members should have courage to do what is best for the team they should actually focus on the work which is defined for the sprint. We'll talk about what sprint is, right? But then the focus should entirely be there on what is needed by the team. So courage, focus, commitment, which is all about, you know, people commit on achieving goals. And we'll, as we you know, understand the sprint goals and everything else, we'll see. Uh, there has to be mutual respect amongst the team members to, uh, to be competent and uh, you know be completely independent, and there has to be openness. It's openness about where are, you know where exactly are we going wrong? What is that we have to do? You know the Scrum team members should be able to express more clearly in terms of their approach and their journey towards uh, the project that they're working on. So courage, focus, commitment, respect, and openness are the five values that Scrum has. Now. How does these values, and it is, you know, so once we talk about the roles, these values 
it, it is expected that scrum team members would imbibe by these values and there are people there are like certain defined roles within the scrum who take care of these values so again not something which comes very prescribed but then yes focus on getting this courage focus commitment uh, openness and trust within the members right okay cool getting a little further now and uh, i really don't want to overwhelm uh, a lot of you today uh, so what we will do is that rather we'll actually uh, my intent for today was to build that foundation before we actually get into the practical application of the scrum tomorrow so we'll uh, probably have one more slight topic and then i can take q a if you have anything and then we'll see uh so i was actually told to define scrum in 100 words and something that's like which is uh, going to be helpful a scrum is an agile process that allows to focus on delivering the highest business value in the shortest time now i'm actually recalling the conversation that we had at the start of the conversation when we actually saw the three pictures right that we would want to get there in the shortest possible time we want to get to the target we would want to achieve the goal in the best possible time the shortest possible time right scrum is a framework that is based on agile that is focusing on delivering the highest business value now the business value could be different depending on the context of the business and the project you're working on but it is all about delivering business value right now business value is a very important term that you want to keep in mind because the success or a failure of any project which is based on scrum is on business value how team is delivering if the business value is not being realized by the stakeholders or the people who are actually sponsoring the scrum or it has not been realized by the business then scrum is of no use right so they would want to make sure that while whatever we are doing remember going back to the values that we are doing what is required by the scrum team to deliver the scope of work and the scope of work is nothing but the business value so the questions that you may want to ask as a scrum team to the project sponsor or anybody who's given it what is that we're trying to achieve what is the business value that we are seeking as we're delivering this project right so if those business value is getting delivered on the work that you're doing then absolutely great right so in nutshell scrum is nothing but it is a combination of three five three three roles five events and three artifacts i'll repeat it's three five three three roles five events and three artifacts and we'll talk more about this as we uncover this like scrum but in a sense scrum guide is all about these 353 they talk about the roles of a product owner they talk about the role of a scrum master they talk about the role of a developers they talk about what are the events that go around within a scrum sprint sprint planning daily scrum backlog refinement sprint review retrospective and they talk about the artifacts which is product backlog sprint backlog product increment and so on and so forth again not trying to overwhelm and so the and this entire image that we are seeing today in terms of the roles events and artifacts is something that we'll be doing tomorrow because that's one piece so once we get this done we will actually be then be able to deliver a working model the day after right and this is exactly what we're going to do is that we are then start to pick up so once we distribute the teams we'll have you know the teams we want to do the roles they would actually do the events they will also build the artifacts around that right so scrum is all about 353 very simple no ifs and buts if i know what three roles are if i am very clear on the five events as what they deliver and the three artifacts 
there is nothing else needed for a scrum team to get started and start delivering. Now, some of you might be surprised that it's only three roles because of, of course, you know, like in my corporate journey, I've always seen that there are multiple roles all across the organization. There are hierarchies of the roles, but Scrum says that you don't require anybody else except those three roles to start delivering. How does Scrum scale to an organization level where we have multiple people working on a project? We'll talk about that. But in a sense, the smallest unit of a Scrum team has these three roles, five events, and three artifacts. And before we wrap up today, and you know, before I give back you the time for today, one important thing, you know, which is kind of not directly related, but it's just something that you would refer again and again, is the sprint. Right? So sprint is a period in which scrum occurs now if you go, if i go back to the previous slide you know you will see that there are these five events that you see so we have sprint planning daily scrum the refinement the sprint review retrospective these five events they occur in a sprint so what means is that it's a time it's a unit of time so one sprint as per the scrum guide can be anywhere between one week to four weeks again no right and wrong to this there are teams who do one week sprint there are teams who do four week sprint there are teams who do three sprints three week sprint industry is on an average doing a two week sprint so which means all those five events right from planning to a delivery happens in two weeks from planning to delivery happens in one week in a one week sprint plan to delivery happens in four weeks in a four week sprint right and then it happens sprint after sprint you see so there is a, so this is a sprint so these are artifacts we will talk about that it gets as an input into the sprint and then so once the sprint is over one there's you know once depending on that sprint size Oh, sorry that like uh, what is the length of the sprint and actually starts to deliver sprint after sprint so we have one sprint second sprint third sprint sprint four sprint five six seven eight until we actually achieve the objective which is getting the business value or getting the output that is required or building a product or whatever it is right so these sprints continue until that uncertainty gets back into the simple mode so in every sprint, we're trying to take care of one level of uncertainty. And then we get into another level of uncertainty and then the third and the fourth, right? And that's the objective of sprints, that with every sprint, we try and come as close as possible, going from the highest degree of uncertainty to the lowest degree of uncertainty, right? Now, what happens with the sprints is that with every sprint, because there are and you will well we'll talk more about it tomorrow as well with every sprint there are completed products there are deliverables which are then been taken to the market to the stakeholders for the review so unlike my time when we had three years to see anything tangible what we're doing now is that we're actually giving incremental builds to the stakeholders they're not complete product but with every sprint there are incremental builds that are coming out and these incremental builds are shared the feedback is taken and then it is again dealt in the next sprint again sprint is done there's an incremental output it is being shared we get the feedback it is being built so what is happening is that even the clients even the customers even this end user the stakeholder they're all they're all engaged right so for example uh, if i was to probably give a real life example to you spotify is an app that many of us use right and you would see there are updates coming on spotify every week 
in terms of we fixed one bug, we fixed two bugs. You know, there's a new release with a new feature. Now, Spotify is one app is, is one organization that has used Scrum extensively to build their applications back then. And so end user in our case, the you know, many of us who use Spotify, we actually the so people give feedback to Spotify. They the Spotify tracks the analytics and then they take that as an input and they start to work on either enhancing a feature or building a new feature, maybe a playlist or maybe offline songs or whatever it is, right? Those features are being then driven via sprints to incrementally build something and roll it out to the next. They can't wait for days and days together to come out because there are competitors as well, right? So the idea with the sprints is to probably produce faster outcomes and take faster feedback from the market as well. If something is not working, they'll get the feedback, they'll try and improvise on that, right? So how would you know? So one of the questions is that, how would you know what I'm building is working? I would say, you don't know, you have to take it to the market, test it out, take the feedback, take it to the sprint, fix it, and then again, go out to the market and test it. So there has to be an incrementally testing within the sprints in terms of whether the product is working or not, whether the feature is actually getting accepted or not. There is no guarantee of working anything. There is always a level of uncertainty, and that uncertainty has been taken care by the Scrum as a framework and sprints as a model. If you actually happen to go, uh, so there are companies like Amazon, who have even come down to one day sprint. They're actually delivering build every single day on their applications. It's mammoth. They have actually taken this to all together next level. Right? So, and there are sprints all across. So once we start to decode in terms of how sprints operate, how the roles, you know, who is doing what and how do we get the requirements, we'll be able to map them. And then once you understand this, right? In terms of the projects that you're doing, you'll be able to start mapping your projects. Okay, what's the best way of getting my projects out there, right? How do I actually start making use of that, what I'm actually picking up in this Scrum, implementing in my projects and getting the feedback and then faster turnaround time. How do I do that? What tools do we use, right? How do we get that? That's all that we're trying to decode. But typically we have to keep in mind that it is, Essentially, the uncertainty of the behavior of the world is what we're actually going to take care of and uh, take care of that. Right. So I'm going to take a pause here and see if you have any questions. I've, you know, I've been speaking for some time now, but I really wanted to make sure that if the objective of day one, the idea of day one was always about making sure that we have an understanding about Agile, we have an understanding about Scrum as a very initial introduction of Scrum as a framework. Tomorrow it is going to be very, very important because tomorrow we are going to uncover the Scrum completely in terms of the roles, in terms of the methods, in terms of the process. We're going to apply the Scrum tomorrow, right? So today was a very foundational day where I did a lot of speaking. Tomorrow, we're going to probably do a lot more those engagements, smaller group exercises about implementing Scrum. Uh, you may want to bring references of the work that you're doing and see how you can implement Scrum in your own projects, and then we can see. But I want to take a pause and see if there are any questions on what we speak or what we spoke today, and if there are still unanswered questions around Agile and Scrum, right? Again, just trying to make sure that you're not overwhelmed, you're not because I just wanted to make sure that it's something that you would really, really take home with an absolute clarity uh, so that we are fresh for tomorrow and then we can actually take it there. Any doubts, questions, anything that you have in mind, feel free. Okay. 
and uh, do I have the right to assume that everything that I've shared is something that is people? Because there are no questions. There are only uh, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Afri. All got clear. Thank you. Okay. So I'll quickly go to uh, some of the questions that we had right uh, here, and I'm just going to make sure that we again revisit in terms of. Uh, so I, I believe uh, we spoke about what is Scrum and Agile, right? Knowledge about the process. I think this is still unfolding. This is you know we'll still build on this the knowledge part, right? Uh, again, this is a very similar about to get some understanding about Agile and Scrum. I'm hoping that today's session would have helped you to get clarity about that Agile and Scrum. Uh, and there are, I think, questions around, uh, you know, how do you want to use it in the projects, right? Uh, or the startups that we have, we will talk about it. How do how do how to schedule a project and how do you want to use it in the startups? We can talk about it, but then, yeah, I'm, I'm going to share this link again, uh, you know, and probably ask Akhil to share this uh, to the WhatsApp number of all the, all the individuals. So if we have any questions that may come to you later in the day, or maybe even tomorrow before you come to the, just feel free to use this and start putting it across so that at least uh, I am more prepared and then I can get some you know, clarity here about this, right? Cool. Uh, Akhil, that's pretty much for day because I uh, I know uh, we wanted to have one more hour, but then I kind of you know realized that it may, may be a little bit too much on day one, so um, had modified the content a little bit just to make sure that this foundation today and will tomorrow we'll get into the execution of the scrum. Yeah, sure, Vivek. So uh, yeah, that's it for day one, guys. So. It was really informative and very basic and, you know, he covered all the foundation on all the fundamental elements, you know, whatever you guys wants to learn. That's what uh, as an organizing team, we want to, I mean, execute in the ground level, you know, you guys, this is a basic methodologies, you know, if you're adopting this in your startup life, definitely that gonna useful for, you know, uh, until you reach the last round felicitation round. Okay. That will help you to get the funding as well. If you're, you know, using all the tools and technologies. Uh, so, uh, th thank you, Vivek. Thank you so much. And I will collect the queries or any other doubts if they have anything. You know, I thought of just creating a WhatsApp group for or this uh, event. Uh, so, what do you think, Vivek? Uh, oh, absolutely. We would love that. You yeah, know, would love to interact with the students. And yes. I know because so some of them may not be, you know, you know, people who have not joined today, they can watch the recording and then they can come back and ask questions. So I think, you know, that WhatsApp group will, will be very, very uh, super helpful. Uh, yeah, also, Akhil, uh, is there a way that, you know, we, you know, probably you can also initiate some kind of feedback for day one, uh, and, you know, what are the things that we're looking at to probably get better on day two? So okay. if, and I'll, I'll work separately with you, but if we can get that sorted out as well, you know, I think I'll be in a better shape tomorrow to, you know, ensure that uh, if there are any loose threads or any loose ends, we should be able to, you know, map it up as well. Sure, definitely. That I will work on the feedback stuff. Usually, we will collect the feedback at the end of the uh, okay. I mean, okay. the session. If that is fine, then I, otherwise, you know, I will collect the individual day feedback, whatever. Yeah. You can. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I'm. You know, I, I'm. I'm trying to get very agile okay. way. Right. Yeah. Got it. So, so spend one done day one. Get the feedback. Implement it on day two, and then yeah. see. Right. So yeah. Uh, but yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you so much everyone for being here. I'm here for another like till you know we decide to completely close the session. So uh, I'll share links of the material. I'll I'll share some. So once I think uh, Akhil, once the group is formed, I'll start yeah. posting some of the references and the links and those you know maybe some of the videos as well uh, in terms of the actual implementation of Scrum. You will come to know so that can be done and we can actually get there. Sure. Uh, sure. sure. Yeah, I'll put the group link here. Uh, guys, please do join. Right now, there are 20 participants. So please do join on this group. We will, you know, make this group active and you will discuss all the questions and everything. Uh, until, at least for the next uh, couple of days. So please do join this group, guys. That's interesting. Cool.
All right, yeah. So, yeah, I think then we can wrap it up now, Vivek. Yeah, sure. I think we can do that. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Really appreciate. Have a good rest of the day, and uh, let's connect tomorrow with some fresh mind and more practical applications tomorrow. Right? I'll not bore you with this theory tomorrow. You'll enjoy the tomorrow session. But this was, I, I believe, important. Hence, that way. Cool. Take Thanks, care. Thanks, Thank you, Jan. Bye. Bye. Take care. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir.